Welcome to part 4 of our mini-series on measurement-based quantum computation. The lecture today is on fault tolerance. Here you see an overview of how one computes fault tolerantly with three-dimensional cluster states. So what's shown here in the middle of the slide is a three-dimensional cluster state and there's various things going on. So there is uh, three cluster regions, V, D, and S, and let's talk about them. So V stands for vacuum. This is what fills most of the cluster. And, uh, well, then there are these fattened rings that wind around one another. They are called defects, and sometimes these defects hold in place what is called singular qubits. That's the region S. So three regions in the cluster, V, D, and S, and they are distinguished by the basis in which the respective qubits are being measured. So everything in the region V is measured in the X basis. Everything in the region D is measured in the Z basis, effectively removing those qubits. And those singular qubits are measured in the eigenbasis of sigma X plus sigma Y. And they are needed to implement non-Clifford gates, as we shall see. Okay, so this is an overall view of the scheme, and we want to explain it. The purpose of this class is to explain how all of this amounts to fault-tolerant quantum computation. Yeah? And so there's two techniques, two observations uh, that we will make. The first observation is that the three-dimensional cluster state is a fault-tolerant substrate. So the fault tolerance is inherent in these quantum states. The second observation is that we can compute with those three-dimensional cluster states by drilling holes into them. And the computation is then encoded in topological information, namely how these holes wind around one another. And all of this amounts to a fault tolerance threshold of about 1%. So here's a bit of background on the threshold theorem for fault tolerant quantum computation. Our task is to maintain the quantum speed up in the presence of decoherence. Decoherence is not good for us. Decoherence tries to drive quantum systems towards a classical regime in which the quantum speed up, of course, vanishes. So we have to do something to prevent that. And the solution we have for this is a software solution. We will compute in certain ways. And at the bottom of this is the fault tolerance theorem, the threshold theorem for fault tolerant quantum computation. And it goes like this. If for universal quantum computer, the noise per elementary operation is below a constant non-zero error threshold, then arbitrarily long quantum computations can be performed efficiently and with arbitrary accuracy. So basically, the goal is to get below an error threshold per operation. If this can be achieved, then essentially one can compute as if without error, modulo small corrections. So this is the fault tolerance theorem or threshold theorem or fault tolerant quantum computation. And it is the cornerstone result of this entire field. It's a very important result. And now the question is, how is this theorem implemented in a particular architecture? And the architecture that we talk about here is that of computing with 3D cluster states. Also an important question is what the threshold value is going to be. The theorem doesn't tell us that. The theorem just says there is going to be a threshold value. But what is that number? If that number is 10 to the minus 50, for example, then the threshold theorem is a nice theorem, but it is without practical consequence. On the other hand, if the threshold value is something like one-tenth or one-hundredth, then this is conceivable to be compatible with uh, technology. And indeed, it turns out 
that it is the latter. So threshold values of 1% or even a few percent can be achieved. Let us now apply the threshold theorem to the situation at hand, namely fault-tolerant quantum computation with 3D cluster states. There's a microscopic view and a macroscopic view, as I said before. Let us begin with a microscopic view. What you see here is the elementary cell of the three-dimensional cluster state. So this cell is repeated over and over in each of the three spatial directions. So what's the dots here? The dots represent the qubits. You have qubits sitting on the faces of the elementary cell. You have qubits sitting at the edges of the elementary cell. And that's it. You have no qubits in the corners and no qubits in the center of the cube. So this is where the qubits are located and these blue lines indicate the corresponding graph state edges. So that tells you which qubit is connected with which other qubit, which qubit is entangled with which. Okay, so this is the cluster state and now we want to do error correction with that. And broadly speaking, it goes like this. So here you see a cluster state stabilizer, more exactly, a generator of the stabilizer, and that consists of a sigma x Pauli operator in the middle, and then sigma z's tensored onto that on the nearest neighbors. So you could, in principle, measure that stabilizer generator by measuring all those five Pauli observables involved locally and then post-processing the measurement outcomes in this fashion. So you would know that each of the measurement outcomes individually is plus minus one, but they will have to multiply to plus one. That's the stabilizer condition. And you could verify that and in this way obtain information about errors that uh, will have happened. However, there is a but. So let's see what that is. Yeah, so all the measurements in the cluster region V are in the X basis. So we are first and foremost interested in quantum error correction in the region V because, as you saw, this fills most of the cluster. And the qubits are measured in the X basis, so we will not be able to read out these. Uh, outcomes of Z measurements locally. So then uh, what do we do? Well, if all measurements are on the eigenbasis of sigma x, the stabilizer elements that we can read out will have to be tensor products of sigma x's and identities. That is uh, what is shown here. And now the question is, are there any such stabilizer elements? That turns out to be the case. And here is an example, in fact, the most important example, the example that we will need. So what you can do is look at the elementary cell and place a stabilizer generator on all of the qubits on the faces, on the boundary of that cube. So this is six stabilizer generators. You multiply them together and you'll find that the sigma z's on the edge qubits drop out. Well, they cancel each other because you have two contributions um, on each of these qubits and sigma z squared is the identity. So the six-fold product of these stabilizer generators gives you this, a six-fold product of Pauli operators sigma x. And that is now compatible with the measurement. So we can measure these observables locally and again, individually, the outcomes can be plus one, minus one, but their product is re required to be plus one if there is no error. So if this product happens to be minus one, this indicates that one of these six qubits over here must have been affected by an error. Good. So this is how we identify errors. Okay, so for now we remember that we have one bit of syndrome per lattice cell. Okay, so every error 
has its characteristic pattern. So for example, if you have an error on this particular qubit here, then there will be a non-trivial syndrome in the cube to the left and a non-trivial syndrome in the cube to the right. And no other error nearby will have this error syndrome. And so you can identify this error. And likewise, you can identify each error by their syndrome. So there's a few questions that you may now ask. Let's start with this one. Okay, so this is all nice and good, but if you look at this syndrome operator, you find that it has support on the face qubits only, and correspondingly, by checking out syndrome operators like this, you only find out what's going on on the face qubits. So what about the edge qubits? How can you identify errors on those? Okay, and this is the subject of lattice duality. Namely, we make the following observation. So you can take the whole cluster and transport it by one half of the extension of the lattice cell in either direction. So this point here in the corner is transported to the center of the cube. Um, an edge qubit becomes a face qubit and uh, a face qubit becomes an edge qubit and so forth. So here, I don't know where that go, maybe here. Okay, and so you see that since you're transporting by half a lattice cell, the lattice structure of the cluster changes, but the cluster itself does not change. This translation is a symmetry transformation. And what it does is it exchanges the face qubits with the edge qubits. And that means you have the exact same error correction that you have for the face qubits, for the edge qubits as well. So all the qubits, face qubits and edge qubits are covered by error correction. And they are treated separately. So there is one error correction running for the face qubits and a completely analogous error correction procedure running for the edge qubits. Now that we have discussed the inner workings of quantum error correction in our setting, at least to some extent, let us discuss the effectiveness of this error correction procedure. And it turns out that we can do that by mapping it to a model from classical statistical mechanics, so-called random plaquette Z2 gauge model. So it's an interesting fact that we can take an error correction procedure and map it to a model in statistical mechanics. Another fact worth pointing out is that this has already been done once before. So the same statistical model came up in the discussion of the fault tolerance of quantum memory with the Tori code. And so that gives us a hint that we will exploit later. Okay, so let's look at the phase diagram of this model. So the phase diagram is plotted here in this image. And what's on the axis? Well, one parameter of that StatMake model is temperature. Temperature you have on the vertical axis. And then you have a probability on the horizontal axis, P. And what probability is that? It is the probability for certain couplings in that statistical mechanics model to have the wrong sign. So that occurs in certain places, completely random, and P is the probability with which it occurs. This probability and the temperature are the two parameters of the model. And uh, they span this phase diagram. So there's two phases in it. There is a low temperature phase in which quantum error correction is possible and a high temperature phase in which it is not possible. So that's the phase boundary in between those two regions and that is the place we are particularly interested in. So there's another object here in the phase diagram and that's the Nishimori line. The Nishimori line is a place of increased symmetry. 
This is also for the purpose of our quantum error correction, um, the submanifold that we are particularly interested in. So what we want to find out is the intersection of the Nishimori line with the phase boundary. And that gives us our error threshold that we can have in this system. So this will lead to an overall error budget of 3%, but this error budget is now distributed among various sources of error, so the error per operation is going to be smaller than that. There is one further reference that I would like to specifically mention in this phase diagram, and this is the point down here. It's not on the Nishimori line, it is at zero temperature, but uh, the junction of the phase boundary with the horizontal axis that leads to a slightly smaller error threshold, and it is obtained by an algorithm called minimum weight chain matching. So this is how the error correction procedure is actually going to be done, and it's a very old algorithm. It was published in a totally different context in this paper down here in 1965. So this is the error correction procedure that is actually going to be used, and the reason is that it is computationally efficient. This error correction up here would not be computationally efficient, and so you're losing a little bit of error threshold in exchange for computational efficiency. Let us now turn to the macroscopic view, and with it to how to perform encoded quantum gates in this architecture. So this is a slide that you have seen a couple of lectures before. It was in fact in the first lecture that you first saw it. And that describes measurement-based quantum computation as a whole. We don't need to go through this entire slide again. There'd be a lot to say about it. But let me just say one thing here. So the basic connection between measurement-based quantum computation and the circuit model was that you could imprint a quantum circuit on this two-dimensional canvas. And in this mapping, the vertical direction on the cluster becomes the quantum register of the circuit model, and the horizontal direction becomes the circuit model time. And now, in 3D, we use the exact same mapping. Now we are dealing with a three-dimensional cluster. One direction becomes the simulated network time, and there's going to be a perpendicular surface, and that still is going to be the quantum register, but it now appears in encoded fashion. And there is a particular quantum code that comes with that construction naturally. We don't have to put it in, it just is there. And that is the surface code. Remember? Random plaquette gauge model, quantum memory. Yeah, so that's the same code we are now talking about, surface code. Okay, so let's talk about the surface code for a little bit. So surface code comes in certain shapes. Uh, certain bells and whistles. So the simplest surface code you can have is on a torus. And no matter how large the torus is, it always encodes two logical qubits. This is an indication that we are dealing with a topological construction. So the number of logical qubits is only a matter of the topology, but not of the size. Now, you can also consider code surfaces and surface codes on them with a boundary. And this is going to be a very important tool for us. Putting boundary on a surface code is going to be very important. There is in fact two types of boundary, rough and smooth, and I will explain on the next slide what that means. But at any rate, the arrangement here with two rough boundaries and two smooth boundaries gives you one encoded qubit worth. But uh, there's other games you can play with these boundaries. So you don't have to have the boundary externally at the edges. You can also create 
internal boundary, namely by drilling holes in your code surface in a certain way. And this is actually what we are going to do. And then it turns out that every pair of holes gives you one encoded qubit. So here this is shown for just two holes, one encoded qubit, but you could put in more. The third and the fourth hole would give you the second encoded qubit, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's one more thing to say about these holes. Namely, they come in two varieties. There is a primal hole and a dual hole. And in fact, they mirror what has already been on the previous slide, namely rough and smooth boundary. So the primal hole is this object here, so it creates rough boundary, and the dual hole creates smooth boundary. Let's look at this terminology a little closer, what is actually happening. You create a primal hole when you do not enforce the stabilizer generator associated with this site. So I'm not going into details about the Tori code. I'm sure you find a lot of resources on the Tori code online. But let me just say this. The Tori code has stabilizer generators associated with the sites, and they are four full tensor products of sigma x. And it has also a stabilizer generators associated with the plaquettes, and they are fourfold tensor products of sigma z. And without the holes, these stabilizer generators are enforced at every site and at every plaquette. But now when you have a hole, you do not enforce them. So the stabilizer shrinks and correspondingly the number of encoded qubit grows. And for each pair of primal holes you get an encoded qubit and for each pair of dual holes you get another encoded qubit. So now let us bring back the third dimension. For some time now we have been talking about what's going on in this 2D code surface. But the cluster state has this third dimension which takes up the role of simulating circuit model time. So let's bring in uh, back into the picture this third dimension and see what it does. So the holes of the code surface they extend in the third dimensions and thereby they just become the world lines of holes. And for the purpose of talking about 3D clusters we call these world lines of holes defects. So these are going to become very important objects of our discussion. Whenever these defects just move in parallel, nothing is really happening. The code surface stays what it is, and this implements fault-tolerant memory on these encoded qubits. But of course, fault-tolerant memory is not what we are really after. What we are after is fault-tolerant encoded gates. And this is how we make them. We create fault-tolerant encoded gates by braiding these defects. And it turns out that this arrangement of braided defects will lead to a CNOT gate between an encoded primal qubit and an encoded dual qubit. In such a fashion that qubit 1, here the primal qubit, is always the target and qubit 2 is always the control. So you can't change that. And this is certainly a restriction. You, so the, if you look at these gates, they always commute. So you can in this fashion so far only create an abelian set of gates. But general CNOT gates are non-commuting. They form a non-abelian group of gates. And so the question is, can you do that also? You might a priori be inclined to think, no, you can't do that because since we have the Tori code here, the anions in the Tori code are abelian objects and probably this translates into only being able to perform commuting gates, abelian gates. But that turns out to be false. It is possible to do general C0 gates which form a non-abelian group, and this is how you do it.
So now you have this more complicated uh, arrangement of defect lines and that creates a C0 gates between two qubits of the same type, in this case both primal. And you can have this arrangement go either direction and so you can so any qubit of those two can be the control and the target, so you can flip uh, the two of them. And this gives you a general C0 and thereby a non-abelian group of gates. So this is what you can do in this topological fashion. The C0 I have just shown, and also you can do a Hadamard gate plus a code change. So the first thing that happens here uh, in this figure is a Hadamard gate, but in addition you change from primal to dual qubit. And the two of them are not separable from one another. One brings with it the other. You can prepare logical qubits in the X basis and in the Z basis, and you can measure in the X basis and measure in the Z basis. So this is what you can do in a topological fashion. So when you look at this, you observe that this is not a universal set of operations. This is all Clifford stuff, and so it cannot be universal. So you need something else. So there is one additional operation that we need beyond the Clifford gates that we have so far looked at to achieve universality. And this is what we need these funny singular qubits for that you hopefully remember from the first slide of my lecture today. And the singular qubits will be measured in the eigenbasis of sigma x plus sigma y. And uh, so what this does is the preparation of an eigenstate of this operator and it prepares this state already in an encoded fashion, encoded with the codes that I've shown on the previous slides, versions of surface codes. But while these qubits or these states are encoded, they are not free of error. And so you need to run a state distillation procedure. For example, you can base this on read Muller codes and make them free of error. But that's all known technology. You can read up about it here in this paper and then combine it with uh, the techniques of state injection, which are used in quantum computation with magic states to get that final gate of the universal set. And that concludes the construction. And maybe one comment I should make Magic state distillation comes with its own decoherence threshold. However, since the technique is based on error detection rather than error correction, that threshold is actually higher. So the threshold of the overall scheme will be the lower threshold, and that is the threshold that I discussed about earlier that is related to the random plaquette gauge model. Okay, so this essentially completes the construction. So there is time, I think, for one rather important remark. Namely, we can take the construction that we developed based on three-dimensional cluster states and map it to two dimensions. And we've already seen the mapping. So it is the mapping that converts the cluster in three dimensions into a surface code propagating in time. We have used this mapping to explain things, but this mapping can also be done in actual physical reality, such that we no longer talk about 3D cluster states, but instead about surface codes propagating in time. And then all the topological defect gymnastics that we did become braiding and fusion of holes in the code surface. So this can be done with physical systems. And in this way, we are mapping from three dimensions, three spatial dimensions to two spatial dimensions plus time. And that mapping has certain advantages for quantum computer architecture. 
So here is what you remain with. All you need is a two-dimensional grid of qubits, yeah, the periodic arrangement with a certain elementary cell and everything repeats in both spatial directions. And on that grid, the only interaction you need is nearest neighbor coupling, no other interaction. So imagine if you would require long distance entangling gates here between various qubits, this would lead to all sorts of traffic jam. People who have lived in Los Angeles know what I'm talking about, so you don't want that. So this is an advantage of short-range coupling. There's no traffic jam. It's easy to print all the required technology on a surface. That's easy to fabricate. And uh, also the threshold is inherited from the three-dimensional scheme, so the threshold doesn't change. To highlight one more time, the most important point here is that this is two dimensions. This is something that can be printed onto waivers. We are getting to the summary of this lecture. So this was about a scheme of fault tolerant universal quantum computation based on cluster states. First, the numbers. So the one number that matters if you talk about fault tolerance is the error threshold. And the threshold value that we are getting here is three quarters of a percent of error per gate allowed in the 3D cluster state architecture or its 2D surface code counterpart. In both cases, all operations are local. That's an advantage. You do not need long range entangling gates. Noteworthy about methods are two things. First, the cluster state in three spatial dimension is a fault tolerant fabric. And the second thing is about gate operation. Encoded gates are performed by topologically intertwining defects. To conclude, a couple of reading suggestions. First, about the computational scheme itself. If you are interested in the three-dimensional scheme based on three-dimensional cluster states, then I recommend this first paper here. And if you are interested in the mapping to 2D plus time, i.e. mapping to the surface code, then I recommend the second paper. I'd also like to point out that there's a review article by Austin Fowler and company on this material. Second, about the threshold value and improvements of it. So the threshold value that I stated was three quarters of a percent and it can be pushed to almost 1% by refinements of the error correction procedure. And you'll find uh, those refinements here in this paper. Let me proceed to the theory advances. The first among the theory advances that I would like to mention is by Hector Bombin. And it's a paper from 2010 that's entitled Topological Order with a Twist. So this is again a paper about the toric code, or the surface codes more generally, and the twists are punctures in the surface codes like the holes. But twists are a little more complicated and they allow you to do a little bit more. You can appreciate the twists maybe most easily if you happen to own a shirt, if you like to wear shirts. So if you have a shirt, what you can do is button it up in the wrong way. And for a long time, you will not notice this. You will notice it only when you reach the collar. And then you see that something doesn't quite fit. So. A twist in a surface code is something like that, but here it's not something wrong, it's actually a good thing. Twists, like holes, can be braided and can be fused, and this gives you a greater variety of gates. Namely, you can do the entire Clifford group by braiding and fusing twists. 
when we were talking about holes here in this course, we could only realize the CSS-ness preserving subgroup of the Clifford group. So also the whole Clifford group is not universal, but it is more than what we could do with the holes alone. Second paper I would like to highlight is by Ben Brown and company, and it offers you more techniques for how to manipulate surface codes in a topological fashion. The third paper here in this list by Sam Roberts and company is about three-dimensional cluster states at non-zero temperature and it makes a connection between the subject of quantum error correction in 3D cluster states and symmetry protected topological order. The final paper here in this list is by Naomi Nickerson and again Hector Bombin and it's called Measurement Based Fault Tolerance Beyond Foliation. So foliation is the mapping that we used a lot in this lecture today. It's the mapping from 3D cluster states to 2D surface codes propagating in time. It turns out if you make the lattice on which the cluster state is based a bit more complicated, then these more complicated 3D cluster states may not permit such a simple mapping. And it turns out that these slightly more complicated 3D cluster states are actually useful in fault-tolerant quantum computation. Namely, they give you a slightly higher error threshold. This brings me to the end of today's lecture, which is also the end of this mini-series. You have learned quite a bit about measurement-based quantum computation and cluster states, but there's certainly more to say. So we have talked about experiment, for example. We have talked about topology and how this is applied for fault tolerance. But there's a couple of things that we didn't touch. For example, there is an interesting connection between cluster states and graph theory. So let me just kind of mention to you the buzzwords that you might want to Google. They are tree width and local complementation. There is interesting connections to a branch of foundations of quantum mechanics, namely contextuality and the quotient Specker theorem. We also didn't talk about that. So there's interesting material to cover in an advanced course on the subject. But for today, I thank you very much for your attention.